Okay, good morning, everybody. Happy May 10th. Uh, we are live right now. We are brought to you by the University of Rhode Island, the place where you go to study and learn how to think big, hopefully, and apply this knowledge to make the world the best possible place uh, in the Milky Way galaxy. Okay, so today with us uh, we have uh, the world famous uh, Patrick uh, Curtis, uh, who is also a URI graduate, and now he is uh, on the opposite coast uh, of the US of A, pursuing his uh, graduate degree uh, in the science of uh, robots. Right, Patrick? Yeah, that's right. I'm uh, pursuing a Master of Science in Mechanical Engineering, and my focus is on soft robotics. Okay, that is awesome. Yeah, it's pretty exciting stuff. I'm uh, glad to be doing it here. Um, URI had a few um, soft roboticists in the ocean engineering department who I talk to frequently, um, but it's a real up and coming industry and hopefully um, it'll make for a fruitful career. Hmm. Okay, well, that's uh, great. So, and did you think about this uh, from uh, your childhood or when did you start getting into the robotics? Oh, no, this is actually a fairly recent uh, passion of mine. Um, robotics in general, I got interested in probably during my time as a student at URI. And I don't know, I always wanted to work on like rockets or something. Um, and uh, I don't know, it just uh, was kind of the confluence of a bunch of different topics I found interesting. So um, I minored in it at URI. Uh, I think I was among the first class of robotics engineering minors. Um, and in the process, I got interested in soft robotics because I was doing material research on soft materials. Um, and that's just not normally how we think of robots. Uh, it's usually a, you know, a much more rigid kind of um, you almost like imagine something from like the Jetsons, right? But um, a robot doesn't need to be that complicated. It can actually be made out of garbage, which is what we do in our lab. Not literal garbage, but like, you'd be surprised at what we do, like the stuff we make. How cardboard and stuff. Is. Yeah, just, you know, like plastic tubing that you inflate and all sorts of random shit. Origami, that's a big one. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So soft robotics is, is uh, like literally referring to the material, of, right? Yep, that's right. Okay, that's what I thought. Cool. That's awesome. Okay, well, that is uh, great. So, uh, and then it's called the soft uh, robotics as opposed to uh, hard robotics. Uh, what the, are the other kinds that we uh, um, have? People usually refer to the, you know, they, they say either traditional or rigid robots. Okay. And there's also such thing as a hybrid, um, and uh, that would be, for example, humans, if you want to think of us like that. Um, you have soft material uh, that's encased with, you know, traditional rigid linkage. Exactly. But really the definition of soft is very fluid. Um, there are some soft roboticists who make basically reconfigurable trusses, and they've I don't know, they've done some mental gymnastics to consider that to be soft just because it's reconfigurable, but the material itself is, you know, hard, it's metal. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty broad right now, and the probably the biggest uh, commercial um, applications at the moment are in medicine, particularly like surgical robotics, um, endoscopes, for example. Um, my PI and another graduate student in my lab are working on like uh, expanding, it's like a, it's called an aversion robot. And if you know those like jelly toys you had when you were a kid that have like little fish inside and you like kind of squeeze them and they turn themselves inside out, it's a, it's like a toroid, a donut mm, or something. Okay. It's basically that, but um, it inflates forward. So that's how it grows, right? So one one of the uh, graduate students in my lab has been working on something to do intubation, which is a medical procedure where you have um, a tube going down your diaphragm to let you breathe while you're in a coma or something. Or, okay. Um, and then another one they're working on uh -huh. is one that actually grows through your colon for like a colonoscopy, so it can reach all the way up your um, 
uh, large intestine. That one's still, you know, in the very early phases. But uh, yeah, like um, there was a woman at Boston University I almost went to get work for who was working on something um, for prostate cancer. That I'll, uh, I'm not going to share the details of that one, but you can kind of imagine what it does. Yeah, yeah, yeah we kind of yeah. know where, where it goes. Yeah. Literally. Actually, you might be surprised where it goes. It's, there's, there's two holes it can go through, and it goes through the one that's probably least comfortable. Um, uh, okay. Well, yeah, it might be. The <laughs> not most to get too straight, graphic. Straight, straightforward. Right. Straight crazy. Personally, I'm, I'm not super interested in my understanding. In I like, <laughs> there's some stuff they're doing for oceanography that professors at URI are doing, and that's what I'm more geared towards, but it's all cool stuff. That's awesome. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah that's, that's amazing. So, uh, and then uh, if uh, there is, let's say, somebody who wants uh, to study soft uh, robotics, right? So, yeah, because they hear about those potential exciting applications, uh, what kind of foundations uh, foundation does the student uh, need to have? Is it uh, mathematics, physics, or some uh, other more specialized classes that they need to study and subjects? That's a really great question, Oleg. Um, so among the soft roboticists I know, it's either they have a background in mechanical engineering or they have a background in biomedical engineering because of, there's so many biological uh, okay. applications for that sort of thing. Um, I would say, like, course-wise, if you want to get down to details, um, it's a very multifaceted topic, so there's no real white, like, right one way to get involved in it. Um, certainly having a strong mathematics background is really great if you want to do anything okay. related to control. So, for example, like lots of uh, linear algebra and statistics and uh, real analysis would be useful. I wish I had more knowledge of that stuff. Um, however, when you get into things like, you know, actuation, I would say having a strong physics background is really good, or a dynamics background. And okay. sensing, um, electronics and materials are vital and sensing is probably uh the topic i want to get involved in the most but have the worst background for. Mm -hmm. okay so yeah um, this seems like a truly interdisciplinary yeah it's, it's very interdisciplinary science or intersubject yeah. yeah pat i i had a question uh uh piggybacking on oleg's question is is there a uh, certain or specific coding languages that are very important to the field that you're in? Um, you would say? Most engineers do everything in MATLAB, but um, gotcha. yeah, so that's, that's more for like the data processing side, which is very, very important. Um, yeah. But you need to know lower level languages as well, especially if you're doing like kind of online control of something, like say with a microcontroller, right? So knowing C or C++ is valuable. I'm sure Python is widely used because everybody seems to be using python these days yeah pretty much um, i don't know i my philosophy towards programming is it doesn't matter what languages you know as long as you know how to program uh, it sounds like kind of a non sequitur but um really like knowing any language kind of builds the foundation for um the you know the logic that goes on in programming and, i think um, so too yeah yeah are you a programmer uh not in title really uh i've just i just finished up my degrees in finance and applied math okay uh, i've been working cool. a lot with matlab this past semester and uh yeah. Tra travis is much better at coding than i am <laughs> i'm like a few steps back than he is but i'm trying to catch up uh it's something that i i really enjoy i'm, I'm trying to get into data science uh, okay that's, years, that's a good so. way to go so i'm, I'm sure r is kind of like the hot thing there i've actually used matlab for data science at one of my internships um, yeah, I was just using it for an uh, optimization class I had, actually. It was pretty cool. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. I was using it for some uh, work with, like, hierarchical clustering, which is a low-level machine learning technique. Um, and I was surprised they didn't have me using Python or R, but I guess uh, they didn't really, like, kind of trust the libraries that were out there or something. Yeah. Plus, it's, the company uh, I was working for had, great. like, a MATLAB license, so they didn't want to buy anything else. Yeah, that would make sense. Uh, so Pat, um, <clears throat> I'm studying computer engineering and applied math, and okay. I'm planning on doing robotics. Uh, oh, for my okay, so, great. Uh, are you pursuing um, a graduate degree? Not yet. I'm still. Uh, I have another year at URI. For okay. Undergrad. Okay. 
Well, you since you're getting a math degree, that's off to a really great start. I've basically only taken controls classes since I've started grad school. Um, and let me tell you, man, there's some students who don't have engineering backgrounds, they have math backgrounds, and they just prefer circles around me. Like, I, I'm so lost when you get to like upper level controls. Like, having a really solid foundation in linear algebra is going to be really useful. And if you get into stuff like model predictive control, which is actually what I'm using for a soft robotics product right now, and also a class I'm getting my ass kicked in. Um, knowing statistics is also really useful, and that's something I have absolutely no background in. So, I'm kind of jealous of you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, that that is awesome. So yeah, we have basically kind of a wide array of, um, I would say, um, uh, core subjects, uh, core classes, right, that you have to take and study. Uh, before you get into the robotics field, right? So, and then for example, when you are at the undergraduate track, right? So you take all those math classes and everything like that. So how do you translate that? How do you connect it to the actual robots? Uh, what are the kind of, kind of connection points? Do you make some sort of program and then make it uh, do something or some device which you program to do something? How does that happen? What was your experience in actually creating the uh, first simple robot? Okay, well, um, you know, Oleg, that's a good question. I'm gonna give you two answers to that. Um, the first way is you don't connect it at all, and you just okay. build something. Um, and the second way is you, this is the very most mechanical engineering answer I could possibly give you, is you start with your free body diagram. Um, so with your free, free body, body diagram, diagram. Okay. you have a set of assumptions about your model, you know, your mass, your uh, damping coefficient, your spring constant, whatever. Um, and then from there, once you characterize what the quantity of each of those is, is you can write out a uh, differential equation for your system based on like what you expect the motion to be. You can turn that differential equation into a set of matrix equations known as your state space. And your state space equations are basically the foundation of any sort of controls class that you're ever going to take. And that's when you're actually applying control algorithms and, and control laws to a system. And all you see is just matrices. It's just linear algebra at that point. So the way you get okay. from, from, you know, the theory to the, to the practice, to the, to the practice is yeah. you, you build your model and then you give a set of assumptions and you just write it out on paper or whatever. Um, and then you can, you could usually, if you, depending on like what level of care you give to it, you can get a very um, good approximation with, uh, with that. That's, that's a model-based approach. There's also something called a database approach, which in the days okay. of deep learning and uh, machine learning is becoming very prevalent. Um, and that's when you're actually learning your system's characteristics from data. Um, and I think that would be more of a, a topic for the applied math slash computer guys down here because my knowledge of machine learning is uh, rudimentary at best. Um, okay. Do well, you guys know anything about uh, database awesome. modeling or control? Um, not extensively, no, not really. Not a whole okay. ton, but it's something I'm certainly going to be working but, I mean, on like, this summer. Yeah. If you're interested in data science, like, you've definitely like explored yeah. deep learning a little bit, right? A little bit, yeah. We, we touched upon it in uh, a couple math classes, but it wasn't really something that was uh, tested on, per se, if that makes sense. So I can't really speak to it to a high degree, but I would, I would also describe my knowledge as rudimentary. Okay. Well, it seems like everybody is doing that these days. Um, what I've heard a lot in grad school is you can publish a shitty paper as long as you have deep learning. So yeah. I would keep that in mind. Um, I'm actually doing another... Um, data-based uh, modeling technique for something I'm working on right now. I'm not super involved with the data-based stuff. I'm more in like the collection part of the project, but um, okay. it's, it's a, it comes from like a, a dynamic, dynamical system, such as a very mechanical engineering related topic, but it actually takes into account the dynamics of whatever system you're looking at rather than just the raw data. So, uh, hopefully that'll be fruitful, but like the papers I have seen on it is that it can outperform deep learning in a variety of ways. So hopefully uh, I get something good out of that. 
Uh, I uh, know a guy who works at a database marketing company. Yeah. Uh, he's in sales, but he can still kind of talk and talk as you have to in sales. And right. he mentioned something that's really important for uh, at least databases was this thing called data e ETL, which stands for easy. extract, transform, and load. Okay. Uh, now I don't know much about it, but I don't, it's not a language. It's, I think it's just more of a process like used to collect data from different sources and transform it depending on what the business uh, needs and whatnot and loading into a database uh, ultimately. And so that's something that I could look into for sure. But I don't know if you knew anything about that. I, I have seen um, a flow like kind of similar to that um, when trying to explain like, you know, whatever um, machine learning process I was doing at one of my internships. It was like discovery and databases, I believe it was yeah. called. Um, it's like, Basically, it was just like some professor's lecture on data science, and uh, it kind of goes over the whole process flow for any sort of knowledge discovery from that process. Um, okay. So that, that sounds like a somewhat similar idea. Yeah, that's great. I'm going to oh, go yeah. read my copy, but um, I think we have reached a good segue point for another one of our topics. Uh, like, uh, but of course, yeah, yeah, that's right. So let's uh, have a look at this. So are you going to refill the cup of coffee right now? Yeah, but I can still hear you. So. Okay, okay, that is great. So uh, yeah, well, uh, if I uh, think about the uh, robot stuff, right? So yeah, to me, so yeah, I can imagine what it looks like on the outside, right? So there's something that moves, uh, maybe grabs <laughs> objects. Uh, for instance, uh, so I hear that there are robots that could uh, harvest tomatoes, for example, or some fruits, right? And then they fall into the category of the soft robots, actually, because they do not crush the tomato. They just kind of grab it softly. So, yeah, yeah. that was my kind of, that's uh, yeah. f first experience about uh, or associated with the soft robotics at some chemistry conference because people were developing the materials that kind of would uh, cover the uh, limbs of the robot and then they would make the limbs soft and the kind of uh, having the good grip uh, on the tomato or whatever kind of the robot had to grab, right? So uh, yeah, and then what's uh, kind of uh, inside the robot? What makes it move? So there is some motor and probably some sort of brain or algorithm. How, how does that happen? What's, what's inside Most the robot soft body? Robots um, they're either pneumatically or hydraulically actuated. So okay. it's by applying a pressure to the internal membrane. Um, so, and if you want to get like, say bending, like you want to try to grasp a tomato, yeah. what would happen is you have some sort of inflatable mem membrane that is adhered to something that can't expand, right? So okay. you're applying a stress to the inflatable membrane and it wants to grow. However, the side of it that is adhered to something that can't grow, won't grow, right? So instead okay. of growing like straight and undergoing a strain, it'll, it'll start bending. Mm, okay. I, I have videos of a project that uh, I did in my first quarter um, of, of such a mechanism, right? Uh, the other one, the other part of that robot that I made was, it was an or origami robot. And basically it was a bunch of folded pieces of paper that had okay. uh, like a, internal membrane that couldn't leak so when you inflate it it would expand i mm. can pull up the videos and share the screen if you want but um, okay yeah that would be awesome idea. sure one second yeah let's uh, let's we do this yeah so, but, i mean uh, there's there's a variety of different ways you could do this like one thing we're looking into is having um oh, like this is more your area of expertise it's a light actuated polymer that changes its chemical structure when exposed to light and that can cause um, bending or vibration or otherwise uh, some other form of locomotion. Okay. Yeah. All right. So yeah, in that case, yeah, you have some material, right? You have an impulse, right? And then that impulse uh, sort of impacts the material, material kind of behaves in a particular way and then it uh, makes the entire structure move. All right. Yeah. Yeah, that, that is awesome. So, and um, if we think about, uh, so 
the robots with the chips in which there is information that uh, makes the robot move, right? So is it already about the artificial intelligence at this point? So if we were to connect uh, AI to the uh, robots? Um, it's not that simple. Um, so the big problem with soft robots is implementing sensors into them. So yeah. basically how most like sensors work is that there is, there's a circuit um, and then there's a change in resistance, for example, or a change in capacitance that will change some sort of output voltage that is then read. So you're correlating, say, I don't know, mm -hmm. pressure or actuation or deflection or something to some sort of electrical signal in your system. Um, okay. There's more than one, like for example, you could use fiber optics if you wanted to implement a sensor. Fiber optics is basically like a tube of glass that's flexible and you can shoot light through it. And the optical signal on the other end can be read and interpreted as some sort of, um, mm. you know, actuation or bending or something. Um, yeah, so the problem with sensorizing soft anything is that you tend to have some sort of hysteresis when you um, apply, uh, you know, whatever configuration to your system. Okay. Like you bend it a certain way. So it might take a certain amount of force to get to a certain position, but then mm. when it returns to its original position, it took less force to get there or something, or there's some sort of loss. So okay. the output from your sensor is going to be changed as well. And you're going to get situations where you have a configuration um, of your arm or actuator or whatever, where it's, uh, it's in a certain position, has a certain posture. Um, but what you might be reading from your sensors could be the same as another mm -hmm. configuration. Mm. And I, I, like a completely different configuration in your, um, in your system. So it's, you have it, the same output for several different inputs. Okay. Um, and you have to be able to distinguish between those to, you know, intelligently control your system. Mm, okay. Well, yeah, that's that's great. So yeah, basically, you might need to have a, a lot of different inputs, right? And then that's what uh, will provide the robot with the various moving patterns, for example. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's it's all about closing the loop. So in control theory, they call it an open loop system is just you give a system a command. Okay. And then it takes that command and it gives you an output. So it's you apply a pressure and it bends to a certain angle or it bends to a certain length. Ah, uh, okay. Um, a and you can change system, the amount of pressure, I think, kind of to provide the range of motion. Yeah. So okay. a closed loop system will actually take information from the system and use it to correct for any sort of mistakes. So this is where your sensors come in, right? It's like mm -hmm. you read your sensors. So say you want the system to bend 45 degrees, right? Um, right. You give it a command that you think should get there, but it's, for some reason it bends to 50 degrees and you need to correct for it. So a sensor will be like, oh, you're too far. So it will automatically cause the system to let up or something. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully you'll get to, um, you know, your target or whatever. But, you know, sometimes uh, what you'll have is you'll have oscillation about your target, which isn't good. Or you'll have just like some sort of steady state error where like even with the sensor it won't correct. These are all like problems in very traditional control theory. Um, so. Okay. Yeah. Wow. That, that is great. So yeah, closing <laughs> the loop, right? So that's one of the main goals, basically. Yes, closing the loop, getting good yeah. sensors so you can close the loop. And that's, that's the dream right now is having reliable closed loop control in a soft robot. Okay, wow, that's that's amazing. Yeah, so uh, what about this uh, AI stuff, right? So um, uh, what do we need to do to make AI happen, basically? Is it about the uh, data science? In my understanding, that's uh, when you have something that receives a lot of uh, data points, and then from that, it can produce some sort of uh, output, right? So that's, uh, is it how AI works or? Well, Trev might okay. laugh at this. Tricky. AI is basically just a bunch of nested if statements. <laughs> yeah, no, okay. um, pretty much. I um I have a little bit of artificial intelligence knowledge, not much, but 
what I, what I kind of learned was that artificial intelligence takes a lot of different areas of expertise to make it all come together. Okay. Um, before uh, me and Travis have to uh, make an exit, I just want to talk about this sure. uh, finance class I had where my professor was really into AI and he had this, he had this project he did with uh, some university, I forget which one, but essentially he created this neural network um, to predict different stock movements and price movements. And the way he did this was with a group of uh, mice, rats, whatever, I forget. But oh, okay. it, was, it, was, it was essentially mice that uh, would respond to this tonal sound that was played. And the tone okay. of the sound was supposed to represent certain volatilities, depending on the number of different pitch or tone rather. And so then the rats could either had an option to go through a green door or a red door based on that tone green for price go up red for price go down and if they were correct they got fed and over the course of two years uh i guess the mice got really really accurate at predicting where this uh the, where the price movement was going to go based on this tonal sound and then which is this is the whack part which i can't really explain they killed the mice dissected their brain extracted a certain protein and then built that into a neural network Oh, wow. uh, through some computer okay. science magic and then yeah and then that was an artificial intelligence uh tool that we used in class to try to predict different price movements and it was it was crazy it was nuts i really can't explain it like besides that overall overall level but um when he said in class and then we killed them i tuned in i was like okay this guy knows what he's talking about so it was pretty well, cool. You can look into it. You can look up rats predicting price movements or something, or rats and stock markets. Uh, there's a, some people have done this uh, around the world, and um, it's pretty neat stuff. So that is great. So yeah. there, is this a URI-based research, or it was uh, performed elsewhere? Uh, as a URI professor, I believe it was with a partnership with a different school. Um, okay. Well, that's. I that's, think they said. Amazing. I think URI said that was too crazy, and they were like, no. Which it is, but it's pretty okay, cool. Well, yeah, but it is something novel. Well, it sounds definitely. like they had some pretty decent results, though. I mean, I haven't read the paper or anything, but yeah, they, no, it was definitely um, definitely pretty pretty accurate. I mean, I I used the it program. It sounds like mad science for sure, but it's yeah, pretty cool no, it was, regardless. Oh yeah, it was. Exactly. Uh, I didn't believe what I was hearing in class, but it it was pretty cool. I looked it up, and it's uh, I could find an article and maybe put it in the comment or something. Yeah, that's uh, that's very exciting. Seems like uh, this is definitely a new a new area of studies that yeah. is truly interdisciplinary. And uh, yeah, who knows what kind of results it's gonna bring about in the future. So yeah, if you can embark on this project now, that might be as well very beneficial later. So yeah, even if that sounds uh, too crazy, but as long as it works that's that's amazing all right well uh that is uh excellent so yeah now we have a, a little bit uh, more kind of idea of how the robot works i hope okay so your background disappeared and we have only uh, the window and the wall behind you patrick <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> at this point so and uh, you are right now in uh, california right so that's yeah. uh, that's where you reside I and think pursue, is, I have pursue to your depart. graduate degree. Okay, well, yeah, in that case, yeah, we'll see you at some point later, Travis and yeah. Aiden. <laughs> yeah, thank, right. thank you for having you. us. Um, you guys have a good day. I would awesome. love to learn more about the work you do and everything. Okay, well, right now, because of COVID, it's a little bit behind, but hopefully, like, around the summer or something, I'll start, like, actually working on publications that hopefully are my own, but, um, you know, um, yeah, just shoot me an email. Um, I'll, uh, I'll let Oleg get us in contact. Because if you're yeah, interested yeah. in robotics, I'm, I'm glad to impart any uh, knowledge I have, so. Yeah, that would be awesome. Yeah, sure. maybe we'll uh, share some uh, links in description with uh, our listeners so that they could- Did you say you're a computer science or computer engineering? I'm computer engineering and applied math. Okay, all right, yeah. I'm uh, yeah. happy to give you any like course recommendations too. So let me know. Awesome. Yep. That's great. All right. All right. We'll be in touch. We'll be in touch. Thanks for joining, Pat. We sorry we had to leave early, but 
All good. It's been great so far. So. Yeah. Awesome. Better. All right. Yes. See you guys.